We continue our World Cup preview of every team going in 2022. We're in Group E, and this doesn't look like the most interesting group on the surface, but the team we talk about today could be the one that changes all of that. The team from Pot 3, Japan. They have a real chance here, even though they're going up against Germany and Spain. But first, how did they get to this tournament in the first place? In Asia, you've got to play like a million matches and qualify. They had to play away to Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, Myanmar. You can't even find most of those countries on a map. That's fine. Uh, not actually. That's offensive. Get it together. Kyrgyzstan's right here. You knew that. Come on. Anyways, Japan got through this first group, which they had to win with a plus 44 goal difference in eight games. They won every match and looked like they were right on course to achieve exactly what they needed to achieve. But then all of a sudden, everything went haywire because in the final group in Asia, you have to finish in the top two to get automatic qualification. Japan's group was not easy. It had Australia, Saudi Arabia, two teams that were at the World Cup four years ago, along with Japan. That's tricky. And it turns out it also had Oman, who in the opening match absolutely stunned the Japanese with a win in Japan that started a four-alarm fire in the Japanese national camp. Japan got through a close shave against China, only to go to Saudi Arabia and lose as well, which means they had three points from their first three matches, which is not a qualifying pace. But that is when the Japanese put on their seatbelts, they put on their hard hats, and they got to work. They won six straight games, including wins over Oman, Australia, and Saudi Arabia, the trickiest teams in the group. And the second win against Australia in that six-match run was the match that allowed Japan to clinch World Cup qualification before a last match draw against Vietnam. Full credit to the team for being able to turn things around. And it's a team that at this point, we completely expect to be at the World Cup. But that wasn't always the case. Japan is a new revelation of the last 24 years. In all my prep and research for doing these videos, this is the weirdest World Cup history I've ever seen. Japan had never gone to the World Cup before 1998. And since the 1998 World Cup in France, Japan has been at every single World Cup. And I was so curious, I did a little research. Research. Turns out Japan actually reorganized its professional league in 1991, and I should say organized their professional league in the first place, because before 1991, Japan only had a semi-professional top division, and they saw their dividends almost immediately. More on that later. But all those runs have seen Japan alternate between going to the round of 16 and getting stuck in the group stage, and the last World Cup in 2018 was the closest they've gotten to getting to the quarterfinals. Japan had a wide open group in Group H. It was Senegal, Japan, Colombia, Colombia and Poland. I mean, that is anybody's game. And Japan started really well. They got four points in their first two matches. Final match day, they lost to Poland, who was essentially already eliminated because their goal difference was so much worse than Colombia. This put Japan in the round of 16 with a matchup that they were supposed to lose against Belgium. It was a heartbreaking loss for Japan, a miraculous win for Belgium, and real evidence that the Japanese are competent at the World Cup and can push teams to the limit. That being said, Japan has never actually beaten a massive team at the World World Cup. Belgium would have arguably been the biggest scalp that Japan has ever taken at the World Cup, even though they've been participating in now seven straight. Group E with Spain and Germany offers a huge chance to do just that. But in Asia, Japan's already the big dog. As you might have noticed by those results, Japan's almost and arguably the best overall team in Asia, where South Korea and Iran haven't won an Asian Cup in what feels like ages. Japan has won four of the nine they've participated in since 1988. And as you probably could have guess they didn't play in one before that. After they turned their top league into a professional league, the next year they won the Asian Cup. That's what I was referencing earlier. They won back-to-back -back trophies in 2000 and 2004, and they won in 2011 when Qatar was hosting. But the last two Asian Cups have shown some signs for worry, just the same as that loss to Oman and that loss to Saudi Arabia in qualifying. It's the first two-time stretch that Japan has failed to win the Asian Cup. I mean, the last one in 2019, they got close. They lost in the final to Qatar, and they had a very impressive run to get there that included a 1-0 win against Saudi Arabia, a 3-0 semi-final win against Iran, two of the best teams in Asia, but still, they lost the final. It was actually their first loss in an Asian Cup final ever. Wait, 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 that's actually not true. Japan has lost twice in the Asian Cup final. The other time, they lost to my Twitch channel because it's undefeated. <laughs> We'll be doing watch-alongs to all of the World Cup matches. The link is down in the description. If you want to join us, that'd be awesome.
The bright spot to take from this tournament in 2019 is that Japan only allowed six goals. The, the downside is that three of those were in the final to Qatar. They, they lost three to one. Another downside for Japan is that they really didn't have a prolific lead goal scorer. Their top goal scorer only put in four over the seven matches of the tournament, some matches against teams like Turkmenistan. Back to the good news. For Japan, that has changed going to this World Cup because Daichi Kamada is going to this World Cup and he wasn't at the Asian Cup in 2019. He is the player to watch for Japan. The 26-year-old attacking player has been a late bloomer for the Japanese national team. Didn't even get the call up three years ago, and he's still been working his way into the lineup. But what he's not working his way into is form. The guy is electric. In 11 league matches in the Bundesliga with Eintracht Frankfurt this season, who, by the way, won a major European trophy last year in the Europa League with Aichi Kamada playing super regularly in that run. Well, his stats this year, seven goals in 11 matches. In the Champions League, it doesn't get any harder than that. He played all six matches and scored three goals. That qualifies as a prolific scoring forward in one of the top leagues in Europe and in the Champions League, the most competitive continental competition in the world. And he is the only player that can say he's capable of doing both those things that fits into this Japanese national team, even if he is new to the rotation and this will be his first World Cup. That obviously makes this his potential breakout tournament and every World Cup has a few breakout stars. Daichi Kamada is playing well enough on huge stages to warrant that. It helps his case that he's improved every year, even when the Asian Cup was going on, Eintracht Frankfurt had loaned him out after an unproductive season to the Belgian Pro League. That's when he got his first call up to Japan. And he fits nicely into a lineup that's been experimented with a little bit. In recent friendlies for Japan, it's been a 4-2-3-1, and I do believe that's how they will line up at least against Costa Rica in their group. The last two Japanese friendlies have been fruitful. They beat the United States, and they clean-sheeted Ecuador in a nil-nil draw, two teams that are going to the World Cup with aspirations for getting out of the group stage. Kamada makes the most sense. He's slotted in behind behind Daichi Maeda, who is the Celtic frontman. Furuhashi, who's also on the Celtic team, didn't make the final 26-man roster for Japan. Really, the whole front four has good European experience. Takafusa Kubo's long been touted as a wonder kid. He'll be slotting in on the left side. Junya Ito fits on the other wing as a natural right winger, and he has been lighting it up at Stade de Rheim. He's played 10 matches and scored four goals this year in Ligue 1, the top flight of France. They've also put two Premier League defenders back there in Maya Yoshida and Takahiro Hiro Tomoyasu as the pair in central defense. Now, Tomoyasu normally used to playing a little farther out wide for Arsenal, but he has the quality that they want him to sit in the middle. Defense is the weakest point for this Japanese team, but that is still a strong starting pairing in the middle. And perhaps good news for the Japanese team, even though the lineup is rapidly evolving, is the head coach Hajime Moriyasu is comfortable adapting. In a match that Japan needed a result in against Australia and really, really couldn't lose to Australia, he went with a 4-5-1, and not only did they get a result, they got the win, 2-0, thanks to some late goals from Kaoru Matomo. Matoma. Sorry. All through qualifying, we saw versatility in lineups. I wouldn't be surprised if Japan had something special in store, at least maybe the 4-5-1 when going up against Germany and Spain. My biggest concern in the team is the goalkeeper Shuichi Ganda. He didn't go to the World Cup four years ago, but he went to the World Cup eight years ago and didn't play. He plays in the J-League now, he's 33, and he has become Japan's number one, but that's a new development that kind of happened in qualifying. And the J-League, obviously, even though it's a good league now, does not have as high a standards as some of these top European leagues the rest of the team is coming from. From and the rest of their competition. So what are Japan's chances of actually getting out of the group? Look, I'm not going to pick them over Germany or Spain, but I do know they will make this interesting. The one notable thing looking at Japan's World Cup history is they beat the teams they're supposed to beat, and they seem to lose to the teams they are supposed to lose to. Even though they're not coming off hot performances in the Asian Cup in the early part of Asian qualifying, they got rolling towards the end and have looked good in friendlies. I mean, shoot, they only lost to Brazil 1-0 in a friendly tune-up in June. They have quality, probably more than you thought, knocking around in the top leagues in Europe, and they have continuity. Their head coach was an assistant on the staff that made that deep run in 2018. I think Japan is going to finish in a strong third position. I would not be surprised at all, and I actually expect them to at least draw either Spain or Germany throughout the course of this World Cup. Japan is primed and ready to go, and once again looks like arguably Asia's best chance to do something special at this World Cup. Do they have a chance to win it? No. They have a real chance, though, to stun somebody, get their coach fired, and get out of the group. Now, if you have enjoyed this video, I've got great news for your bingeable mind. This is a whole series. Obviously, we're in Group E. It started in Group A and has come all the way down. That's the link to the whole series. I hope you enjoy it. I have a mustache for most of it. You should be warned.